does Satan actually look like a serpent in Genesis chapter 3? So let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. That seems like a good place to start. Genesis 3 verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So in Genesis 3, we see that there's this character, this person, that is clearly described as a, a serpent, but it's obviously a serpent who talks. Now, let's, you, we all know that that's the devil, but just in case there's any confusion on that subject, look with me at Revelation 12. Revelation 12. One of the fascinating things about the Word of God is that when you're studying the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, many of the most important cross-references are in Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And it's just curious how God has designed that. Obviously, the same spirit that wrote Genesis wrote Revelation and all the other books of Scripture, and that's why you can find those cross-references that are literally thousands of years apart in terms of when they're written. So look with me at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Notice, that old serpent, that old serpent is a reference to Genesis 3, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, in that verse, it's very clear that that old serpent is a reference to the devil, uh, is a reference to Satan. Look at me at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. And look with me at verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So we've seen very clearly demonstrated twice that the serpent of Genesis 3 is the devil, it is Satan, it's, it's, it's one and the same. So we know that in Genesis 3 verse 1, when it talks about the serpent, it's really talking about Satan. Now many people get the idea that since Satan is described there as a serpent, that he looks like a serpent. But let's, uh, I want to just pull up some images here, and this is um, what I did as I went on DuckDuckGo, a search engine, and I pulled up, um, I can't remember the exact search I ran, but it was something like Satan and Serpent. And what you're going to see here are some images that I just pulled off the web. So this is a search you can demonstrate yourself. You can repeat this. It's, it's, it's easy to do. And so, okay, look here. So this is obviously the garden. This is Eve. And who's that? Well, that, that's Satan. And, and he's portrayed as a literal serpent there. You can see the fangs and the body and the tail and all that. This is another Eve with the fruit there. And, and what is this? Well, it's, it's a serpent, and it looks like a literal serpent. This is Eve again with the fruit, and there's the serpent poking his ugly head into the picture. This is uh, Eve with what looks like an apple, and then see the forked tail and the body, and that's obviously a serpent as well. This is sort of a comical one, but there's Eve, the fruit, and there's the serpent, and it's a literal serpent. Again, Eve, fruit, literal serpent. Eve, fruit, literal serpent. And uh, we'll go back to that one in just a second. But what I want you to notice from all that, th th this is ever present, okay? In other words, this is very, very common. You can run that search for yourself, and you will see that it is very common for Satan in the garden to be portrayed, to be de de depicted, to be visually represented as a serpent. But if you, if you do that, you'll also occasionally notice, so this is not very common, this is, this is much rarer. But here, this is Eve. 
and you can see the fruit, and then there's someone whispering in her ear. Well, well, who's that? It's it's not Adam. That that's obviously the serpent. That's that's Satan. But he's portrayed there as not a snake, but he's portrayed there as some sort of man slash angel slash God type thing. So this imagery exists with Satan as some sort of man, son of God type thing, but it's far more common. It's ex- it's far, far, far more common to have him actually pictured as a literal snake. Okay, so now let's think about this. So that is the, the common... Um, That is the common way he is perceived. And I'm just going to X this off here. Um, That is the common way that Satan is perceived. But I'm going to suggest to you that I don't think that's the way that he really appeared. And there's several reasons why that is, and we'll just go through them. If Satan was actually a physical serpent, if he appeared as a physical serpent... Well, he would have been the only animal in the garden who spoke, right? So in other words, if you think of the garden, there were lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and there were, you know, raccoons and woodchucks and so on, and none of them talked. And by the way, none of the other snakes talked, right? He would have been the only animal appearing thing that talked. So it would have been very odd if, you know, Eve is there in the garden and there's multiple other serpents because Satan wasn't the only one. Obviously, God created serpents. For him to be the only one that talks would have just been, it would have been strange. It would have been odd. Now, go back with me to Genesis 3. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3, and look with me at verse 5. Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God doth know, this is the serpent speaking, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, plural, knowing good and evil. Now notice what Satan says in Genesis 3 verse 5. He says, for God, capital G, God, God the Father, Jehovah, God doth know. Well, he's, he's referencing there God the Father, and Eve would have known who God the Father was. But then in that same verse, the serpent says, ye shall be as gods, plural, knowing good and evil. Now, what's fascinating about that is for that statement to make any sense, ye shall be as gods, plural, Eve had to have already been familiar with what that means. It it had to have meant something to her. So she already had to have some form of awareness of lowercase g, gods. That's not a reference to mankind. That's not a reference to God the Father. That's a reference to the the angelic type beings, the sons of God that you'll see later on in Genesis 6. Eve obviously had some awareness of those creatures If she didn't, then Satan's statement there wouldn't have made any sense. So think about that for a minute. If you're Satan and you're trying to deceive Eve, does it make more sense to show up as a a snake or does it make more sense to show up as a God-type creature that Eve was already familiar with? Look with me at Genesis 3, verse 14. Now, notice what this verse says. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou, so thou is singular, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So let's look very carefully at the language of Genesis 3.14. Because thou hast done this. Thou is singular. So it seems to me that what the Lord is doing there is he's not speaking to the serpents as a group of animals collectively. He's talking to an individual person. He's talking to what 
Revelation 12 and Revelation 20 described as that old serpent. In other words, he's saying, you, Satan, because thou, singular, hast done this. Then what it says is, thou, singular, art cursed above all cattle. Well, think about that just for a minute. Does it make sense for a snake to be cursed above all cattle? Well, that just doesn't fit, right? Because a snake is not in the cattle family. As you think of biology and as you think of the, the animal kingdom, there's different classes of animals, right? So to do the, the, the simplest illustration, if you think of the wolf or the dog class, it's a singular class, but within that, are there all sorts of different breeds and types of dogs and wolves and so on? There is. Well, what Genesis 3 says there, thou art cursed above all cattle. Well, how does it make any sense to curse snakes above all cattle because a snake is not a cattle? But if you think about Satan, you know very clearly from Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28 says that Satan is the anointed cherub that covereth. Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10 tell, tell you that a cherub is very much like an ox. So the reason that Satan was cursed above all cattle is not because he physically looked like a snake, but because he was the anointed cherub that is very much like an ox, and Satan was cursed above all cattle. Then notice what the next part of the verse says. Upon thy belly shalt thou go. Now, if you look at the, the whole verse together, Let's go back up for a minute. Because thou hast done this, in other words, because of what you just did, thou art cursed above all cattle. In other words, you did this, and now there's a consequence. Well, now look at this. Because thou hast done this, upon thy belly shalt thou go. Well, think about a snake for a minute. Did a snake only start to crawl on its belly after Genesis 3? I mean, think about it. Snakes don't have legs. Snakes have to go on their belly. They don't really have a choice. It's not as if the, the snake could, you know, walk on its legs before that time. It, 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 it couldn't do it. So the very wording of the, the, the verse tells you, because thou hast done this upon thy belly, shalt thou go? It's not a reference to snakes. It's not a reference to a particular reptile going on its belly. It's a reference to what's going to happen to Satan, that Satan is cursed as a result of what he did. Now look with me at Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity between thee. Thee again is singular. In verse 14, he says thou. He's talking to the serpent. And then in verse 15, he says, thee, he's again talking to the serpent. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman shall bruise his head and thou shalt bruise his heel. So we know that between thy seed and her seed, the her seed is, is a reference to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. Now, what it says here is, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Is there any verse in Scripture where a snake, a reptile, harms the Lord Jesus Christ? There's not. So, and is there a verse where the Lord Jesus Christ uh, bruises the head of a snake, of a literal reptilian snake. There's not. But does that happen at the cross? Yes. In other words, what happens at the cross is that Satan bruises the Lord's heel, symbolically, 
and the Lord bruises Satan's head. It's not as if the Lord at the cross is, is crushing a snake that he grabs in his hands and destroys. But what happens is the cross is an event where Satan bruises the Lord's heel and the Lord bruises his head. What, what, I'm, what I think this all demonstrates is this. The verses describing Satan as a serpent are not referring to his physical appearance, but his spiritual character. Serpents are a good symbol, a good metaphor for Satan for a couple reasons. The first is people are naturally scared of serpents because what they do is they enchant. They, they mesmerize. In other words, what serpents do is they sort of hypnotize their prey. And what they do is they're, they're sneaky and they're predatory. So they, hypno, you know, they, they, they mesmerize their prey and then they attack. So they're sneaky that way and they're predatory, which is a perfect description of Satan's character. See, what Genesis 3 is concerned about, it's not concerned with painting you a picture. Let me ask it this way. Does the Bible contain words or pictures? It contains words because it's trying to describe for you the spiritual reality of what's occurring. It's not trying to show you a movie. It's not trying to give you visual images. Think about it just for a moment. We walk by faith, not by sight. What we need to do is we need to understand the words. We need to understand what the words are telling us as to the spiritual reality of what's taking place. It's not designed to give us something that is a visual manifestation. Now, by the way, if you think of the, the serpent metaphor for Satan, that is something, that symbolism still exists today. Have you ever known someone who was very untrustworthy? Well, I'm, I'm sure you have. What do people refer to that person as? Sometimes they refer to him as a snake, right? They'll say of that person, he's a snake in the grass. In other words, he's dishonest. He's deceitful. You can't trust him. Well, why are they saying that? They're saying that because Genesis 3 established that the, the serpent is a symbol uh, for Satan. It's a symbol of the deceit, the dishonesty, the lack of trustworthiness that Satan has. Now, let me ask you a different question. And here's the question. If I asked a sixth grader, if I asked someone in grade school, what does the devil look like? And I said, just tell me some things as to what the devil looks like. What are the things that they would say? Well, you know these. Well, they would say he dresses in red, right? They would say that he has horns. They would say that he has a pitchfork. They may say that he has a pointed tail. In other words, right now, in your mind, if, if someone were to say, draw what a devil looks like in the cartoons, you could do it, right? Because he has a very, very distinct image. But can I tell you that's not real? The way that deception works the way that con men work is they work by giving the appearance of honesty. They work by giving the appearance of trustworthiness. If you think about the devil just for a minute, if the devil showed up and he's trying to deceive someone and he has horns sticking out of his head and he's red and he has a pitchfork and he has a pointed tail. And everyone in the world that's, you know, knows anything says, I know who you are. You're the devil. I don't trust you. There's nothing he can say that you're going to believe because you can't get past the fact that you know he's the devil. What that tells you then is this. Satan is never going to manifest himself in that way because it is at odds with his desire to deceive. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians 
chapter 11. And notice with me verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed. So can Satan change his appearance? Apparently he can. Notice what he did in verse 14. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Well, think about that just for a minute. If, if 1 Timothy 4 tells you that there are doctrines of devils, is it going to be effective to teach doctrines of devils if you send out a bunch of people wearing red and carrying pitchforks? It's not going to be effective because they won't be viewed as credible. They won't be viewed as trustworthy. They will be viewed as deceivers. Well, look what Satan does here. How does Satan appear? What visual appearance does he take so that he can deceive people? Well, he looks like an angel of light. Verse 15, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. So are Satan's ministers today, do they appear like organized criminals? Do they appear like bad guys? Or do they appear to be the ministers of righteousness? It's the same thing as wolves in sheep's clothing. The wolves don't want you to know they're wolves. So what they do is they masquerade as sheep. Satan's ministers look like, they're not, but they look like ministers of righteousness. And what does Satan himself look like? An angel of light, according to that verse. Well, if he looks like an angel of light, he's obviously trying to portray a positive appearance. Would he have shown up in Genesis 3 and said, hi, I'm a serpent. I slither around and I'm nasty and gross and your, your skin crawls just looking at me. He wouldn't have done that. What you're seeing is that Satan is fundamentally a deceiver, and he's going to appear as something that he is not. Look with me at Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Now, the studio audience said, don't take it literally. Au contraire, take it literally. But the question is, what does it say? When Jesus Christ says, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, is he saying that the cup is his blood? Or is the use of language there him saying, no, it's the wine in the cup that's my blood? In other words, it's not saying don't take it literally. It's saying you have to understand what it's telling you, right? Look with me at Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Look at Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Now, Ezekiel 28 is going to tell us about the king of Tyrus. And what's interesting about this is it tells us some things about him. He sealest up the sum, he's full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. So, Quite the, quite, the, quite the person. Now notice verse 13. Thou, so that's the king of Tyrus, thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Well, who is this? How many people do we know of that were in Eden, the garden of God, that could possibly be the king of Tyrus? There's only one obvious person, and it's Satan. So now read this, read the, the rest part of this verse. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond. The beryl, the onyx, and the jasper. The sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. So let's put verse 12 and verse 13 together. So what verse 12 tells us about the king of Tyrus is he seals up the sum full of wisdom, and then notice, perfect in beauty. 
Verse 13 says he was in Eden, the garden of God, and then it said, every precious stone was thy covering. Well, based upon those two verses, does it sound like Satan in the garden appeared as a reptile that was slithering around, or did he appear as something that was likely perfect in beauty and had every precious stone was thy covering? So think about precious stones for a minute. I'm sure you've done this. When you take a precious stone and you you hold it in daylight or you hold it in bright light, what happens? Well, it reflects light and it refracts light and it, it sparkles, right? You've seen this happen. So imagine this. If, if Satan manifests himself as an angel of light and every precious stone was thy covering, it would be rather dazzling, wouldn't it? That would be far more impressive than, oh, I'm a little snake and I'm crawling on my belly and I really think you should eat this fruit. It's just, if, if you're trying to, if you're trying to deceive Eve, one of those tactics is far more likely to be successful than the other. The first thing Eve would have thought if there's a reptile talking to her is, what's going on here? This is weird. But if it's someone that looks like an angel of light, and she was already familiar with the gods, Genesis 3, 5, then it fits together rather perfectly, doesn't it? Look with me at Ezekiel 28, verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. That's yet more proof that what we're talking about here in Ezekiel 28 is it's Satan. It's, it's the devil. Verse 15. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. So we're told twice in this same passage that Satan was given a great, a great deal of beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Oh, he's not only beautiful, he's what? He's bright, like an angel of light. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, and they may behold thee. So what I'm going to suggest to you is this. So in Genesis 3, verse 1, when it talks about the serpent, is Genesis 3 trying to paint for you a visual picture of what's going on there? Because it doesn't tell you what kind of serpent. Was he a green serpent? Was he a red serpent? Did he have stripes? Did he have polka dots? It doesn't tell us because the purpose of Genesis 3, the purpose of the scriptures, is not necessarily to give you something that looks like a film. It's not trying to, to give you images of what transpired. What it's trying to describe for you is it's trying to describe for you in words the spiritual reality of what happened. Now, people sometimes do think, well, that, that's not being literal. Well, think about that just for a minute. Sometimes uh, the, the spiritual reality is far more intense than just the physical reality. So, for example, when, uh, when a team loses a close game, they call it a heartbreaker. Now, it didn't literally break their physical heart, but can it break their spirit in a way that is perhaps even more significant? Yes, it can. Think of it this way, in Genesis 3.15, when it said that the, the seed of the woman would bruise his head, does that mean that the Lord did a karate kick and he kicked the serpent in the head and Satan has just a teeny little bump here that's swelling and all he has to do is put ice on it? Well, no, what it's, what it's referring to is the fact that what the Lord did at the cross is he destroyed Satan. In, in fact, Hebrews 2.14 talks about he destroyed the devil and his works. So it's, understand that it's, it's not something where uh, the use of language here is, is, is lessening or taking away from what the Word of God says. It, it's, it's a situation where when you understand the spiritual reality of what's going on, it's much deeper 
it's much more significant than simply describing a picture to you. So get 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians 4 and John 8. I want you to look at two verses at the same time. So you can decide for yourselves what you think is going on in Genesis 3. I don't believe that Satan appeared as a snake. It doesn't make any sense. What he appeared as is he appeared as some sort of glorious creature that looked like a son of the gods or a god or an angel of light. It was something where Eve looked at and she was impressed by. It wasn't a reptile. It was something where he was dazzling, such as an angel of light, with every precious stone as his covering. Now, I want you to compare two verses with me, because if you put these verses side by side, I think they'll help you understand a lot of what's going on in the world. So we'll do John 8.44 verse first. John 8.44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth. Why? Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So one of the things you know about Satan is there's no truth in him. He's a liar and he's the father of it. Now compare that with 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So let's put those two verses together. If Satan is a liar and the father of it, and there's no truth in him. In other words, he's deceitful, he's dishonest, he's the father of lies. He just lies constantly. He lies like a rug, okay? And he's the God of this world. Both of those statements are true. What does that tell you about what the world is going to be like? The world is going to be full of of lies. It's going to be full of deception. So when you do things like simply listen to the radio, watch TV, read the news, read newspapers, read magazines, do you know what you're going to be reading? You're going to be reading, you're going to be encountering things that are full of lies. Not a lie here and a lie there. Not an occasional exaggeration. If Satan is the God of this world and the father of lies, then what should you expect to see throughout the world system? Lie after lie after lie after lie. And that, unfortunately, or depending upon your point of view, that's exactly what we find. The world system is just endless deceit. Now, get with me, if you would, Revelation 20. What that means is this. For as long as you're on the earth, you're going to have to deal with that. In other words, you're going to encounter lies on a daily basis. You're going to encounter falsehood and deceit. And the only thing that's going to solve that, it's going to be solved for the body of Christ by the catching up. It's not going to be solved on the earth until the Lord returns. Now, by the way, think about this. When the Lord returns, how does he deal with the deception problem? Look at me at Revelation 20, verse 3. And I heard Revelation 20, verse 3. And cast him, let's read verse 2. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him, that's Satan, into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him. Notice what it says that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. What's Satan been doing up until that time? Deceiving the nations. 
God says during the millennial kingdom, I'm not going to let you do that. But that verse says till. What happens at the end of the millennial kingdom? He's let loose and he goes out and he deceives the nations of the earth. And so there's just going to be deception on the earth. And one of the things Satan is going to deceive people about is he's going to deceive them about his tactics. He's going to deceive them about his doctrines of devils. He's going to deceive them about his appearance because he wants people to be deluded and to fall into his snares. In fact, that's a, that's a word that Paul uses, snares, because what the devil is, the, the devil has no ability to overpower the body of Christ. He has to deceive us, and that's what he attempts to do. Get with me 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And I'll, uh, I'll close with this verse. So tonight in the United States is the presidential election, and uh, we will be learning at some point uh, who will be the, uh, the president and who will be the various senators and members of the House of Representatives and, and so on. And so I thought I would close with a verse that I think is important for the body of Christ to follow. Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So what does 1 Timothy 2 tell us to do? Well, we should pray for our leaders. And it tells us that we should pray for our leaders whether we care for them or not, right? It says for kings and for all that are in authority. And the purpose of that is that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life. And the idea is not that we are um, rebelling, not that we are, you know, being insurrectionist and, and causing problems, but the idea that we should lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I, I pray that that's what, would, what we would experience in the United States. I pray that we would be able to lead quiet and peaceable lives. I pray that we would have opportunities for the gospel to, to be presented. So, you know, when you think about Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel of Christ, is the power of God unto salvation. The power that people need today is not economic. It's not military. It's not medical. What, what people need is they need the power of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. And that's, what, that's the message that we need to teach and preach and share with this world.